We're in Hebrews chapter number four this morning. <clears throat> We're just going to take a little snippet from this classic passage of Scripture. We won't do any dishonor to the passage because the subject is taught from cover to cover in the Scriptures. But the wording here I think is helpful and it give us an illustration that we can understand. So Hebrews chapter number four, verse number one. Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into its rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached, as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. For we which have believed do enter into rest." Just a little snippet. Most of you know that I sell on eBay. It is a hobby of mine, and it allows me to support uh, Bible colleges for national pastors uh, around the world. Uh, on top of my faith promise giving, this allows me to do a little bit of extra. And I've learned one thing on selling on eBay. People are crazy. <laughs> Weeks, I guess, months ago, I got a letter from a guy, a, a letter in the mail from a guy. He was so happy with his purchase, he bought something for $12. He was so happy with his purchase that he wrote me a letter, sent me a picture of the item, and included another $20 bill in the, in the letter. Keep those cards and letters coming. Those are the crazy people you like. But not everybody is quite so nice. A year or so, maybe two years ago, I got... A letter, a, a letter in the mail addressed to eBay customer service. You did not realize they had a division in Swan, but <laughs> that's me, eBay customer service. It was from a lady who had bought a vintage hair dryer, one of those machines, you know, that had the hose that you wore the cap thing, probably from the 60s. She had purchased this item, and she was upset because it was used. <laughs> I don't know the word vintage, the fact that it said it was used, and there were 12 pictures of a used item. I don't know if she believes that I have a warehouse full of 1960 brand new stuff. I don't know. But anyway, she was not that happy. I've learned people are crazy. You just got to love them. But now, after telling you that, when you get... When you sell stuff, generally speaking, you never hear, 99% of the people, you never hear from them, other than the feedback they leave you, uh, which is also interesting, but you never hear from most of the people. But when you do hear from them, you're not quite exactly sure what you're going to hear. And so yesterday, I got a letter, an, a message, my phone dinged, an eBay message, and there was a message from a woman who had purchased something from me. It was a little recipe card, metal card file box. Your grandma probably had one. It was printed, made by Ohio Art, by the way, who made extra sketch. That'll give you a connection. Anyway, it was full of old recipes, handwritten recipe cards. And I had sold it, and she purchased it. And when the message came in, when I clicked on it, it was a really long message. That's typically not a good thing. But as I read it, she was really happy with the purchase. And she is a collector of recipes. And what she wanted to know is where it came from and if I had any more recipes that I could that was with the set. Because she tracks these things and she makes kind of a history of these people. She wanted to know their name and their history. Well, unfortunately for her, I buy thousands of items a year from garage sales and flea markets and, and auctions. And I couldn't even tell her, we go, when we go on vacation, we do the same thing. So I couldn't even tell her it came from Iowa. I don't even remember. So that was not very much help her. But she wanted me to send her our recipes, which if you knew who I am, that's really a strange, <laughs> funny thing. <laughs> I had no recipes to give her. But I do have one for you this morning. The recipe for rest. That is the title this morning, The Recipe for Rest. Let's pray. Father, we ask that you would do your work now. Lord, 
if we had a thousand years and the genius of the smartest people who ever lived, we could not make one step forward here. But your spirit is so powerful and your word is so precious that if you would have put the two of them together in our hearts, you could move all of us farther forward than we ever even dreamed possible in just this one service. So we do not rely on our own strength, but on the omnipotence of you and the power that you put within your word and the ability of the Holy Spirit to teach it. Honor the Lord Jesus by moving your children forward. For we ask this in the precious name of our Savior who has made this purchase already. Amen. The recipe for rest. It is my desire this morning to be incredibly simple. I want to put truth on the bottom shelf so far down that any person can reach it. Don't let simplicity throw you. We often like to be complicated. We often like to try to grasp big subjects. But the Christian life has been described as becoming as little, not just children, little children which means that it can't be that complicated. We like it to be compli complicated because it makes us feel like we're all grown up. But generally, it is the plain, simple truth that makes the greatest impact in our lives. This thing that we call life has very little rest in it. Have you figured that out? Our forefathers termed it a dog eat. It is a dog eat dog world. Think about that term. Think about what picture that's drawing. That's what our forefathers called this. They termed it a rat race. Shakespeare called it a veil of tears. James in the Bible calls it, says, You lust and kill and fight and war, and still you don't have what you want. It seems like in every area of life we strive and we fight. We strive to be successful. We strive to make ends meet. We worry over finances and family and the future. We try to carve out our place in this world. We try to leave our mark. We are in a constant state of trying to make things stronger, faster, and more shiny. And we do what it takes to make that happen, at least most of us anyway. There is, of course, in our society, in any society, a portion of people who just do nothing. They are content to live off the work of others. They are happy to do nothing. They have no plans or desires. They are the ink, eat, drink, and be merry crowd of our day. They are at rest simply because they have no ambition, they have no desire, and they refuse to take responsibility and life seriously. So, in our world, it seems like there are two choices. Even as Christians, it seems like we only have these two choices. Either we fight and we strive and we slave to make it, or we do nothing, be nothing, and just let time run out and root waste the life given. This is the two options it seems that we're faced with. Get in that dog-eat-dog -dog world, or excuse the phrase, but we use it all the time, live in your mom's basement until you're thir past 30, all right, playing video games. <laughs> you understand? That's kind of the two options it seems like we have. we got to fight and strive or just do nothing and waste our life. But there, my friend, is another alternative. There is a third option for God's people. There is a rest for the people of God. A life that moves forward, that's not idle or sluggard, but it does it without the fight and struggle. It moves forward while at rest. And the passage here gives us indirectly the recipe for it. Let's reread the passage. Let us therefore fear, lest we lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. 
For unto us was the gospel preached, as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. For, which, for we which have believed do enter into rest. It's a very simple recipe for rest here. There are two ingredients in this recipe. Did you catch the two ingredients? If you didn't catch the two ingredients, look at it again. The two ingredients are there in that passage of Scripture. We have two ingredients to rest, to, for the recipe for rest, and we find that is the Word of God and faith. These are the recipe, these are the ingredients that make up the recipe for faith. Now, before we get into the recipe, let's examine these ingredients before we put them together. Think about the first ingredient, the Word of God. Have you ever, what do you say about the Word of God? What do you say about the scriptures? How do you encapsulate that one ingredient? I don't know of anything so precious as the Word of God. But at the same time, I don't know anything that is taken so for granted and so, treated so common as this book. It is the greatest treasure that we have. Yet we act like it's last year's newspaper. Do you realize what you are holding in your lap this morning? It is the Word of God. It is the instruction for life. It is the wisdom that your Creator put down in black and white. Do you realize because of this book, you do not have to wonder what is right and what is wrong. You do not have to guess at what is good and what is bad. Because of this book, life does not have to be a series of trial and error. Do you know what the problem is? I was contemplating this this morning in my office. Do you know what the problem is with learning and gaining wisdom by trial and error? What I found out is by the time you gain enough wisdom by trial and error to have any clue about anything, you're too old to do anything with it. <laughs> the game's over, and you just learned the rules. That's the problem. How many understand what I'm talking about? The game's already over, and you find, I finally may be getting a clue about some things, and the game's over. That, because of the scriptures, you don't have to live that way. Because of this book, you do not have to live by trial and error. You don't have to just bungle your way through life. Young people, I never come to the left side of the pulpit. This is difficult. I like to keep something between me and the, and the teenagers. But <laughs> actually, it's because I worked with the teenagers all of my growing up year for 20 years, and the marker board was always on that side, and so I always went that way around so I'd be next to the marker board. And so it's a habit to go to the right. I broke my habit. Man, I feel uncomfortable over here. <laughs> Cast yourself on the left side of the pulpit. All right. <laughs> Young people. There is a school of hard knocks. And that school of hard knocks does actually teach. And once you've done something wrong, you learn that was really stupid. Our forefathers had a saying that says, even a mule doesn't bump his head in the same place twice. <laughs> that is the school of hard knocks. But as every adult in this room will tell you, when you bump your head, it hurts. When you bump your head, it leaves a scar. You can learn by the school of hard knocks, but even a mule doesn't bump his head in the same place twice, but you know what? There's a lot of places to bump your head. And so you go through life beat to pieces in this school of hard knocks, thinking, I'm going to, I'm going to learn this. It's no way to live. You do not have to live that way. You have been given the book. You have been fortunate enough 
to be born in a place where the Bible is so prevalent you can go to the dollar store and buy one. You, are, you have been allowed to come to a place that loves the book, reveres the book, and teaches the book. You have grown up with this book. Do not take it for granted. The school of hard knocks is a rough teacher. Will I hear an amen on that? There's the people who know. The school of hard knocks is not the way to go. Almost every amen you heard could have been avoided by just listening to what this book says. The school of hard knocks is a very hard teacher. And we would, as a church, not desire you to learn that way. You do not have to learn that way. You have in your hand the wisdom of God for your life. You know what, age 12, you can act with more wisdom than an 80-year-old who is full of life experience. Because at t age 12, with the book, you can act with the wisdom of God. And that is what every person in this room would desire for you. Here's what you hold in your hand. Look at verse number 12. This is what you hold in your hands. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a cerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open under the eyes of whom, with whom we have to do. This is a powerful book. In addition to being filled with the wisdom of God. This book is filled with truth and promises that God has bound himself to. This is a very, get your, try to get your mind to wrap around that. It is full of truth that God has pound, bound himself to. The church has a bunch of junk that we've been trying to get rid of. It's got a little bit of value, so they told me to try to sell it on on the marketplace. And so we, we listed this stuff on the marketplace, and a guy told me on Tuesday, I will be there in the mid-afternoon. At 4 o'clock, I texted him and said, uh, sorry, but I've got to leave. I can't. Oh, I wasn't going to make it. I, I got held up. But I will be there on Thursday, early afternoon. At 4 o'clock, I text him again. I wrote him and said, I'm leaving. Oh, I had trouble, uh, and I'm not going to make it. But I still, I got to have that stuff. I still got to have it. So, he's going to come on Tuesday. Now, I'm not a gambler, but how many of you would like to take that bet? <laughs> I had his word on it. Now, I think he actually wants the stuff, and I think he did have legitimate excuses, legitimate things that happened. But guess what? He told me twice, dead set, I will be there. And he's not been here yet. None of us are too shocked on that. Now, if I said to you, I am going to do thus and such, most of you would say, that's a lot safer bet. Because I really value my word. And I try to not ever give and promise something that I can't come up with and can't do. And that I do not fully intend to do. But if you've known me more than a year, I've probably done, said something to you that I have not come, up, come through with. You'd be hard pressed to find someone that I have not failed in my word to. You had my word on it and I intended to keep it, but my word... Sometimes you just, life happens and you just can't make it happen. But we have God's word. Yes. Now my friend, you can take that to the bank. It is exactly what he said. He's going to do exactly what he said. There's going, it's going to happen exactly like he said. He has bound himself to it and he's not going to break it. 
He has never broken it, and you're not important enough to break it on him. He is going to make it happen because he always speaks truth, and that's what he said. He is bound by the word, his own word. It's a book full of promises that God has bound himself to. That's the first ingredient to your recipe for rest. The second ingredient is faith. And we often like to complicate this. And I don't know why people are like this, but we like to complicate things. And we like to complicate this word itself because if we, I don't know, if we don't understand it, then we're not liable to it. I don't know why we do these things. But the passage defines it for us. It's very simple. Uh, the word preached did not, verse number two, the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. But verse three says, for we which have believed. So the, the word is actually defined. The, per, the first people did not have faith, and the second people believed. They, that's the definition of it. One is the noun side, the other is a verb side. Faith simply means to believe, to trust. Do you know that the ability to believe is a gift from God? Ephesians 2 tells us this. Do you realize that human society is not possible without the ability to believe? Try to think that through. You brushed your teeth this morning. You believe that the guy who made the toothpaste was not trying to kill you. He didn't put something in there that would make you die. You believed that. You came walking down your stairs. You believed that the carpenter who built those stairs knew what he was doing. That's some, a lot of faith in <laughs> these days. You also believed that the wood that they used would stay together and not collapse and drop you two floors. You got on the highway this morning going 55 miles an hour which is very fast, by the way. And do you realize that on that highway, there's another car coming at you 55 miles an hour. That is a combined speed of an impact of 110 miles an hour. That's fast. And that's a whole lot of metal coming together. And you're passing within, what, four or five feet of each other. And you believe that that guy on the other side of the road will stay on the other side of the road. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We have some misplaced faith, do we not? But you know, you drive down the road, how many cars did you meet coming to church this morning? A hundred? And you didn't give it a second thought because God has given you the ability to believe. If you did not have to have, if you did not have the ability to believe, you'd have to go off by yourself and try to live in the middle of no place because you couldn't trust anything or anybody. But he gave us the ability to believe. Now, the problem is that we have taken his ability, what he's given us, and we have focused it on everything but him. The intent was for us to believe him. But we decide to believe our neighbor. We decide to believe our family members. We decide to believe somebody we don't even know and fail to believe God. We have faith. We have both ingredients. We have the word of God, a very precious thing, and we have faith, both of them gifts from him. Now the recipe for rest is very simple. You mix the two of them together. The problem is that we seldom use the recipe. This happened to the people of the Old Testament that are being referred to in this passage, verse number 2. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them, but the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. They did not mix the two ingredients together. Now, what good is the Bible if you do not choose to believe it? Now, the Bible is true whether you like it or not. The Bible is true whether you believe it or not. Your disbelief does not make it untrue. Your belief does not make it true. It doesn't alter the Bible at all. It is true. That's just the facts. What 
if you don't believe it, then you don't reap the benefit of it. You do not profit by it. If you do not mix the word with the faith that was given to you, if you don't mix the two together, then the Bible has, is not profitable to you. You don't reap the benefit. Now, let's try to be clear here. Almost every person in this room has generic faith in God's word. If I were this morning to list a thousand truths or promises you, and say, do you believe that? You would probably all say yes. If I said to you, do you believe that God is almighty? Everybody would say yes. Do you believe that God is omnipotent, meaning he has all power? You'd say yes. Do you believe that God is omnipresent, meaning he's everywhere? You'd say yes. Do you believe that God cares for his children? You'd say yes. Do you believe that God leads people? You'd say yes. Do you believe that God is loving and kind? You'd say yes. But that's generic faith. It's not a personal faith. It's not a, in this situation, for me, personally, faith. Okay, let's put it on the bottom shelf again. If I asked you today, do you believe that a bank lends money? I think everybody in here would say, yes, that's what they do. If you want money, you go to a bank and they lend it to you. Everybody would agree with that. But that's not really the point. The point is, do you believe the bank will loan you money? That's where the benefit comes from. To just walk around and say, yep, the banks lend money. Everybody believes that. Where it makes a difference is when you say, I believe the bank will loan me money. That's personal faith. And this is the type of faith that has to be mixed with the word. A personal faith. It is only effective when you personalize it. There's a difference between generic faith and, and personal faith. There's a difference between I believe God helps people and I believe God will help me. There's a difference between I believe God loves people with I believe God loves me. I believe God directs people and I believe God directs me. One is generic the other is personal. The word of God has no profit to a person unless it is mixed with personal faith. The recipe calls for the word and faith. Some people just try to mix faith with something else or just by itself. You know what the most common used recipe for rest is? The most common recipe for rest is mixing faith with our own efforts or plans. We want to be at rest, so we see a problem. So we determine the solution, and then we trust our own solution is the right one. We put our faith in our solution. We, we trust that we will be able to control the circumstances. We trust that the actions of others will fall in line with our expectations. We trust that our evaluation of the situation is correct, and we trust that our solution is the right one. We see the problem. We want to be at rest concerning the problem, so we come up with a solution and then put our faith in our, our solution. Now, let me ask you, how much rest is there in that? How long does that rest last when you put your faith in your own solution? About 10 minutes. Why does it take 10 minutes? Because it takes about 10 minutes for you to realize there was a flaw in your thinking. You find that, oh, there's a piece of this puzzle that I didn't know about, so my solution doesn't work. We find that people do things that you don't expect. Have you found that out yet? You play this thing out in your mind, so you plot your solution, and then somebody does something totally off the wall. You're like, why did you do that? That ruined my whole plan. People never do what you expect. 
And so your, your rest goes all to pieces because you didn't count on that. You find that the results are different than what you anticipated. You find the flaw in your logic. You find your own inability to carry out the plan that you proposed. What we have done is put our faith in our own understanding. And God tells us specifically, don't do that. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. And lean not. Do not put your faith in your ideas. Do not put your faith in the way that you see this thing. That's a recipe for disaster. It's not a recipe for rest. And he says, don't do that. But this is the most common recipe that we have. We try it. We fail. Have you realized how bitter the taste is from that recipe? Putting your faith in your own plans. Not only does it taste bitter when it's going on, it leaves an awfully bad aftertaste. You think, now right now you can taste some of it. The leaning on your own understanding plans, put your faith in your own works, and you can still taste that aftertaste in your mouth right now. It's not a good recipe. Yet we keep baking that same thing over and over and over again. You want to know what's even more ridiculous? The recipe that we use for rest all the time? We have one really ridiculous recipe. We attempt to have rest by using faith all by itself. We attempt to have rest by using faith all by itself. Now, we don't think of it typically in those terms. But it's faith believing all by itself. When you say to somebody, good luck. Now, let's be honest. How many of you have said that to somebody in the last six months? You say to somebody, somebody, good luck. What is that? What's that faith in? That's faith all by itself. How much rest do you get from that? When, after you said that, now, are you just dead sure that everything's going to go well for these people? This situation is going to turn out well because I said good luck to them. You see, that's faith all by itself. What a ridiculous recipe. When you say, have a nice day, what is that faith in? Well, I guess I'm just going to have to go out and have a good day because you told me to do so. It's got, everything's got to go right because that was wishful thinking on our part, was it not? Let's try one that really hurts here. If you have kids, you'll understand this better than if you don't have, if you're not old enough to have kids. But when one of your loved ones, especially one of your kids, is going to go on a long trip in a car that's not the best, and you're not quite sure how good of a, tra a driver they are. How many know what I'm talking about? <laughs> okay. And you say, have a safe trip. Now, do you go home and go in the house, and they pull out the driveway, do you go in and sit in your easy chair and think, oh, I had them, wished them a good trip, and I'm going to feel so much better. They're going to go all the way. You say, I worried them all the way there and all the way back. <laughs> Why? Because that's faith all by itself. It wasn't mixed with anything. It was wishful thinking. And that recipe is a ridiculous recipe for rest. We've all tried it, but it doesn't provide rest at all. It's faith mixed without anything. Now, the recipe for rest is very simple. You already have both ingredients. God has given you the ability to faith, have faith. You have his word. But you cannot use them independently. 
They must be mixed together in order to provide the rest that you desire. So let's put this in its, see it in its operation. Many people in this world are worried about their eternal destiny. They're wondering, where will I spend eternity? This is a very worrisome thing, a very unrestful thing. Some people, it is so unrestful, it's so worrisome that some people just, I don't want to think about it. I, I'm just going to ignore it. And if I ignore it, then I, and I don't think about it, then it doesn't have to be true. That's a really foolish thing to do, by the way. Ignoring something doesn't make it go away. Ignoring it doesn't provide rest. So how do we find rest concerning our eternal destiny? Well, just like the Bible says, we take the word of God and we add faith to it. So what does the word of God say? Excuse me, Romans 5, 8, but God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 10, 13, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. I could quote another hundred verses that say all the same thing. We have the word of God. Jesus Christ died in your place. That's the word. That's the truth. But it doesn't profit you on its own. For, for, us to, for you to say, God sent his son, doesn't profit you. Jesus Christ died for the sins of the world, doesn't profit you. Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world, doesn't profit you. That's generic faith. What does profit you? Personal faith. When you say, Jesus Christ died for my sin. Yes. Jesus Christ is my Savior. I put my faith in what Jesus Christ did. That's personal faith. And guess what you find happens when you mix the word of God with faith? You find rest for your soul. Dozens, 90% of this crowd, I'm guessing, this morning would say, I, found, I, I, I can attest to that fact. I found rest for my soul. I took the word of God I mixed faith with it, and you know what? I am as sure as I'm alive that I'm going to heaven when I die. I am sure of it. That's rest. comes from the Word of God and mixing faith with it. That recipe brings rest for your eternal destiny. You know, for your assurance of your salvation, people are strange. Very often, God's people will do this. They will trust Christ as their Savior, they use the recipe, the Word of God, and faith, and they, they, they trust Christ as their Savior, and then afterwards they change the recipe. And they lose the assurance of their salvation. Why? Because they changed the recipe. Do you want to have assurance of your salvation? Take the Word of God and believe it. The devil, no, the, let's just be, I'll be transparent for you here. I am Pastor Scott. I have been pastoring at this church. I've been working for this church for over 30 years now. I have been saved since I was a young, probably eight years old. It's a long time. And do you know that on a semi-regular basis, the thought comes into my mind, are you saved? Are you on your way to heaven? Now, that used to bother me. I don't let it bother me anymore. You know what I say now? Romans 5, 8. But God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I believe that. And the devil throws that thought in my mind, and I just say, well, you can argue with God, but here it is. I choose to believe him. And guess what I find? Absolute rest. I'm more sure I'm on my way to heaven than I'm sure that this is a suit that I'm wearing today. I know it. 
because God promised it. And when my faith mixes with his word, I find rest. Now, this applies all across the board. When you have to make a difficult decision, and everybody in this room who's older than the age of 15 or 16 is making difficult decisions. You may not know they're difficult, and afterwards you figure out, oh, man, alive, that was an important decision that I think I just blew. So you never know which is the important ones and which ones aren't, but we all face difficult decisions. Now, how are you supposed to know which one is right? Your track record, by the way, isn't very good. You have blown it a lot in the past. So how do you know? How could you ever rest on your track record? How could you ever rest on your genius? You couldn't. Ah, but there is rest. The word of God says, Psalm 32, 8, I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way that thou shalt go. I will guide thee with mine eyes. When you take that promise and you take, I'm going to believe that, and you mix the two together, guess what? You find rest. I face a lot of difficult decisions, and I know I'm not very smart, but I rest. Why? Because he said he'd tell me. He would instruct me in what I'm supposed to do. I don't have to be the genius here. He is. And I can rest in his genius, his wisdom, and the fact that he told me he'd tell me how to do it. And when I will take his word, and I put my personal faith mixed with it, I find what comes out is rest. There is a rest for God's people. How about for financial matters? All of us face these. I can tell you, I can remember one time we were struggling because the kids, one of the kids had had surgery or something. We were, maybe one of the kids were born. I don't know. We had a huge doctor bill. I didn't know what I was going to do. And I thought, my thinking, okay, if I just don't quite give all my money to the Lord this month, bad idea, by the way, but I won't just give my money to the Lord this month. I'll use it to pay the doctor's bill, and next month I'll catch up. Anybody ever had those thoughts before? So I'm thinking, Lord, what do I ought to do? I'm trying, I'm churning up because I, I got all this bill. The Lord said, I was reading through the scripture, and I came across this verse. Pay your vow unto the Lord, and call on me in the day of distress, and I will deliver thee and thou shalt testify of me. You know what I'm doing right now? Fulfilling that verse. Because I paid my vow to the Lord. I was in distress. <laughs> we had to, I had to empty the piggy bank to go buy groceries. We never missed anything the Lord provided all the way through. There was never any loss. You know what? He provided. There was rest. I knew exactly what to do. You see, why? When you take his word and you decide, I'm going to believe that, you find that he is an ever faithful God. All right, let's take one of ours and we're almost done here. Next time when you've got a loved one who is going on a long trip in a vehicle that you would not really prefer they go in. When you say, have a good trip, think about the word of God that says, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Now, when you put that into it, God, who has much better care over them and much more concern and a lot better at doing and protecting, says, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. When you'll take that promise and you'll take your faith and mix it together, you'll go uh, sit in your easy chair, easy. Why? Because they're not alone in this deal. He will never leave them nor forsake them. There's rest in that, my friend. A lot better than, have a good trip. <laughs> because now you are in the right mindset. God cares and he watches over our children. 
What is this? It's the recipe for rest. You take what God has already bound himself to. You mix that with your faith that he gave you. I'm going to trust what he said. And what you find is rest. That's the recipe. You already have the ingredients. You mix them together and you have rest. George Mueller said it better than anybody else, I think. He said, let your finger point to the promise where your faith rests. This is what I believe. Not, good luck. This promise right here is what God said, and that's what I choose to believe. Amen. And that, my friend, you will find. The word of God and faith is the recipe for rest. Let's pray.